So thank you very much uh, again to everyone who's joined us. Um, I'm Sean Fury. I'm the director of the Rural Water Supply Network at SCAT Foundation. And I'm delighted to be joined today for this very special event by Professor Rob Hope at the University of Oxford, who directs the REACH program. And after some opening remarks, he'll be followed by presentations by Christina Nielsen, uh, the consultant who did the majority of the, uh, the, the detailed analysis of this work that you'll be hearing about, Dr. Duncan McNichol from the Uptime Consortium, and then Dr. Saskia Nowicki, who's a postdoctoral researcher, uh, also at Oxford. After the presentation, there will be a, uh, an opportunity for a short Q&A, but this is just part of the conversation that we'll be having that we hope that we'll continue with you after this event, but we aim to close up after 45 minutes. So next slide. But before we start, I'd just like to give a huge thanks to all the people that have been involved in this piece of work. Uh, over the last few months um, and the huge effort that they've put in. Um, Richard Carter, Elisa Shortard, Harold Lockwood, Melissa Norton, Rina Saltzman, Slava uh, Zorowski, Caroline van der Vorden, and uh, also the reviewers who put in a lot of time and really made the, this report a lot, uh, lot better as, as we developed it. So thank you very much to all of you as a team who have uh, contributed to this work, which has been funded by the United Kingdom. And I would like to thank them. And I would also like to thank Rob for the, the opportunity this, that this 100 million initiative and this survey that we've done uh, on rural water supply operators has given us as a network to really reach out and connect with rural water supply operators and regulators around the world in a way that we haven't been able to before. And this is very much the direction that uh, we as a network want to go. So thank you very much. But now I will hand over to Rob to take us through uh, the rest of today's uh, session. Many thanks, Sean, and um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I've just got a couple of slides just in terms to outline the motivation for the study. Um, they're, they're listed before you. I think they're familiar to all of us working in the sector in terms of the, the significant challenges we face through the climate crisis at the moment, through floods and droughts, compounded by the global pandemic of COVID-19, how it's sort of increased the urgency and the saliency of providing safe drinking water, um, also for hygiene and hand washing services around the world. So it's, it's timely, I think, why we're doing this work. Um, we also know from colleagues in UNICEF and WHO that we're off track. The recent report that came out is um, fairly um, dismal reading in terms of many parts of the world where we're significantly off track. And there is a sense of how, how can we correct this? What do we need to do together as a sector to look at some of these issues? Um, and this, as Sean's mentioned, is we have um, you know, often un uncertain and limited data on the performance of rural water, rural water service providers. And this has been revealed, I think, during COVID-19 that we didn't really have the visibility of what was happening within the sector to allow people to support um, as much as they did for the urban sector. So this is something we can hope this would be one step in the process of correcting that. And if we turn to the next slide, um, I'd just like to outline very briefly the three objectives of the study. Um, you can read them before you here. I mean, it's just to give us a sense of professional water service provision in rural areas. What does that look like globally? We've not really had an opportunity to have a diagnostic exercise to look at the global landscape around this. We've had very good work from RWSN over many years trying to help us think through this. And this has been an opportunity to do um, a wider scope of that. And provide by professional water service provision, we're looking at um, a cohort of many, many organizations that are working to provide a, um, a guaranteed level of service to a particular standard, whether through reliability or water quality, affordability metrics, but they're, they're sort of contracted to provide these services. Um, and there's, you know, this is the terminology we're using in this report and some other work that's going on. 
Um, we're very grateful for everybody who's participated. A huge, a huge thank you to everybody who submitted data that Christina will take us through in a second now. And this has provided us with self-reported metrics of operation on financial performance. And this has given us, you know, important insights in terms of where we are and things that can be done to take this work forward. And then the final objective is based on this, what is the size and scope of um, service provision and how could that take us forward, particularly in the area of results-based funding. Um, and this is something that Duncan will talk to us a little bit later in the presentation, but it's an area that we have done some work in the sector on. There's been output-based aid that's looked at this in terms of infrastructure investment. There's been the large, what was DFID FCDO program on payment by results. And then more recently, Uptime have been trying to look at this in terms of payments contingent on the delivery of results. It's not a magic solution to everything as we recognize, but there has been progress and there's been a number of organizations that's been working on this. And it was one of the areas we wish to explore from this survey. So I will now hand over to Christina who has done most of the analysis for this work and she'll take us through the presentation with um, support from Saskia as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So the Global Diagnostics Survey was an online and voluntary survey in English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, and Mandarin, which was promoted to rural water service providers from May to July of this year. And we received a total of 448 responses. After cleaning to remove some duplicates and some organizations that were not involved in ongoing rural water service delivery, uh, we were left with a total of 358 responses from 68 countries, which we analyzed. And together, these serve an estimated 15 million people using around 3 million water points, which include a mix of hand pumps and piped infrastructure. And the response from these service providers includes some more and less active management and oversight of infrastructure. And, and so further work would be needed to provide a more precise estimate there. The responses included a few very large service providers. Um, so on the screen, you can see seven, which reported working with over 100,000 water points. Um, and together, these, these seven account for 64% of the total water points um, of the respondents. Some of these, and as also some other large service providers, appear to be large national and subnational entities, um, including some utilities. And so further research would be needed to unpack their roles and responsibilities. Uh, the response also included some government-linked service providers at national and at subnational levels, which are outlined here. So these include national ministries, some decentralized departments, uh, government utilities and umbrella agencies. And some of these describe roles in direct service delivery, while others provide oversight from a distance or include a mixture of different types of service roles. And then most of the respondents uh, were at 257 non-governmental service providers. So these included various types of international, national and local NGOs some community-based organizations, associations, committees, social ventures, and private sector enterprises. And these types of service providers are anticipated to include the most applicable candidates for future participation in results-based funding. So now we will look at the findings from these 257 non-governmental service providers. And then we'll look at findings from 101 uh, government-linked service providers. And of course, more details are available in the full report. But first we can look at reliability. So most service providers are aiming to repair broken infrastructure quite quickly. Um, of 173 who described breakdown response as part of their operating model, most, 68% here in blue, are aiming to repair broken infrastructure in three days or less. And now I'm going to pass over to Saskia, who will speak to some findings on water safety. Saskia? Thanks, Christina. 
Yeah, so um, about, well, 98% of the survey respondents reported that they're doing at least one type of water safety activity. Um, the activities that we asked about are grouped as water point focused, uh, point of use activities at the household level or at schools or health facilities and reporting activities. Um, so the water point focused activities include monitoring, this is regular water quality testing and or sanitary inspections. Um, source protection, like fencing or excluding latrines or other potential sources of pollution from the catchment of the water source. And treatment, which was reported as regular treatment and or reactive treatment in response to water quality problems. The point of use activities included hygiene training, testing at the point of use and household level water treatment. And the reporting activities were specified as reporting to government, um, to water supply operators or managers, or to users. We also asked about um, water service providers, um, uh, whether they were engaged in water safety planning. Um, and just over half of the respondents said yes. Um, but the wider water safety activity responses indicate that respondents have varying interpretations of which activities um, they include in water safety planning. Um, so the profiles of activities were not consistent with the water safety planning framework that's put forward by the WHO necessarily. Um, so there could be follow up work here to understand um, what these varying interpretations of water safety planning are. Um, but for now, it's difficult to interpret that response in particular. So instead, to get a sense of where more comprehensive water safety activities are occurring, we focused on four pillars of activities. Um, change slide, please. So these pillars are water point monitoring, source protection, water treatment prior to the point of collection, and reporting results to government managers and or operators. We focused on these four pillars um, because of their important functions for understanding the water system and identifying hazards, dealing with hazards, and having information feedbacks in place. Um, you'll notice that we've excluded the household level activities here. This is partly due to concerns about self-efficacy for sustainably managing water safety at the household level, and also the feasibility of scaling service provision that targets activities at that most dispersed level. So the Sankey diagram on the slide shows that almost half of the service providers that reported doing water quality testing also reported doing source protection. Of those doing source protection, 40% uh, reported doing regular water treatment. And of those doing regular water treatment, again, about 40% said that they were reporting to government managers or operators. So comparing these results to some of the other data from the survey, we found that these four pillars um, are positively associated with service providers collecting payments for their services um, and using systematic payment methods, uh, which means volumetric or subscription-based payments rather than irregular or on breakdown payments. Uh, so I'll pass back to Christina now, and she's going to talk more about those revenue collection patterns. Thank you, Saskia. So on revenue collection, um, we found that about three quarters of service providers report that they charge for water services, while the others provide services without necessarily charging. Um, and there were slightly fewer charging service providers in low income countries where it was about 72%. Among those who are charging for water services in the middle of the screen, we can see a little bit more about who pays. So, um, 74% of service providers are collecting at least some payments from individual users. We can also see a bit about how payments are structured. So volumetric payment structures are most common. And as Saskia mentioned, there is a high use of systematic payment methods. So 77% of service providers don't include payments on breakdown or, or other irregular payments. And so are um, only using systematic payment methods. So volumetric payments and or payments by a subscription period, like weekly, monthly, or annual payments from users. We can also see a bit about how uh, payments are made. So cash is very widely used, widely accepted, but nearly half of those who are accepting cash are also accepting some other payment method. 
like mobile money, prepaid payments, bank transfers, or in-kind payments. Mobile money specifically was accepted by about 29% of service providers, and nearly half of those were from Kenya and Uganda. Uh, we also found that payments are used for a variety of purposes. Um, and one interesting finding was that about a third of service providers in low-income countries are paying part of user fees to government, including through taxes. And this is about twice as often as service providers in lower middle, upper middle, and high income countries reported that part of user fees are paid to government. Finally, uh, more than half of service providers report receiving financial support to subsidize the local costs of their operations, including um, from sources, including governments, donors, NGOs, and the private sectors. And the service providers that do not report receiving operational subsidies, um, the other ones don't report that, but don't provide evidence that users are generating sufficient revenue from operations um, and capital costs. And so this would require some more investigation and cautious interpretation. Uh, we also found that service providers in low income countries less often report receiving subsidies for operations and more often report paying part of user fees to governments, including through taxes. And on the other side, service providers in high and upper middle income countries more often report receiving subsidies, including from governments. We also have some findings about shocks and specifically the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on operations. So about one third of service providers in orange reported major negative impacts to their operations from the COVID-19 pandemic. And these included decreased funding, increased operational cost, uh, and or decreased revenue collection. And the most impacted service providers were more often not charging for water services. So this slide provides an overview of the key findings from the global diagnostic about reliability, water safety, revenue collection, subsidies, and shocks. And the yellow points here indicate that there were similar findings from government and service providers as well. So on reliability, most service providers are aiming to repair broken infrastructure in three days or less. Almost all service providers report at least one type of water safety activity. Uh, most service providers collect payments for water services and about one third of rural water service providers reported major negative impacts to their operations from the COVID-19 pandemic. So next I will pass the mic to Duncan who will speak about next steps. Great, thanks very much, Christina. Um, we've understood now a bit about what services are doing and a bit about where they are. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is talk about the implications. Uh, what does this mean and what might we do next? Uh, specifically looking at implications for increasing the scale and sustainability of safe and reliable rural water services and looking at results-based funding as one opportunity to do that. Next slide, please. I'll start talking by talking about two of the key barriers to sustainability and scale that we identify in the report. The first is shocks. Uh, as we all experienced, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, had unprecedented global impact, uh, but we find that the effects of the pandemic were a bit uneven. And specifically, services with weak financial management appear to be more vulnerable. So for example, Christina talked about this a bit, uh, the severity of impact from the pandemic uh, seems to decrease as the share of service providers charging for rural water services increases. And, and th this might indicate that directing resources to service providers with stronger financial management systems could be a more effective, uh, transparent, and sustainable uh, approach for targeting funding. The second barrier is subsidies, and, and specifically a need for effective and transparent ones uh, subsidies are contentious, though common in the, in the drinking water sector. Uh, by country income category, we find that service providers in the lowest income uh, category are less likely to have access to a subsidy, as Christina mentioned. Uh, and there also appears to be a number of potential benefits linked to water safety, uh, with water safety that are linked to subsidies. 
And, and we think this might suggest an, an unmet need, uh, particularly among service providers in low income countries, and that subsidies, if well targeted and supported by effective and transparent financial management, uh, could improve the scale and safety of these rural water services. Uh, next slide, please. And from this, we identify, from recognizing these barriers, we propose four conditions for the sustainability and scale of rural water services. I'll touch on these briefly now, but there's more detail in the report. And, and what these aim to do is recognize some of the complementary roles necessary for service delivery that include water users, service providers, and then independent authorities and regulators. Uh, the first condition we highlight is policy alignment. Uh, which speaks to the policy priorities and legal obligations at national and subnational levels. Uh, as we all know, effective policy itself does not guarantee service outcomes, uh, but can provide a clear framework to allocate responsibilities between the government, water service regulators, and service delivery models. The next condition we identify is public finance, uh, which needs to consider the blend and sustainability of public funds, donor transfers, and user tariffs. Uh, for example, results-based funding from public sources could be used to, say, complement uh, user payments to support service sustainability and scale. Uh, but in all cases, public finance needs to be available and then well-targeted, efficient, fair, and smartly applied. The third condition is professional service delivery which reflects a contractual approach where the risks and responsibilities in the delivering affordable, reliable, and safe drinking water services are allocated clearly and fairly between service providers, users, and authorities. So a service provider would be mandated to fulfill certain roles in proportion to its capacity. Users are assured of a certain level of service and reporting and regulation ensures that these service conditions are met with penalties for violation. And then together that ensures a, a robust service quality. And, and then the final condition, certainly not least important, is data, which are central to assessing and funding these rural services. Because without means to monitor delivery, uh, effectively issuing funding, results-based funding is, is just not feasible. In the report, we highlight two examples, uh, one from Bangladesh and one from Central African Republic that illustrate how these conditions uh, can be at different stages of development in different contexts, but then could lead to entry points for engaging at, at these different angles to try, and, uh, to try and promote the scale and sustainability of these rural services. Uh, next slide, please. Understanding from the survey, uh, understanding global opportunities to engage governments at, at national or subnational levels on policy alignment and, and public finance uh, requires more follow up. Uh, but an immediate opportunity seems to emerge from directly engaging non government service providers that have verifiable data. And, and here I'll speak specifically about results based funding which is non-repayable grant funding to sustain and scale services that deliver verifiable outcomes. And what we've done here uh, and in the report is apply some basic criteria to identify who could be eligible uh, for this type of funding modality. And this means that the service provider is uh, doing maintenance services, that users are paying for it, and that they receive or, or need a subsidy. There's some sort of funding gap uh, the logic being that services that are already financially viable could uh, access commercial financing. And, and running this uh, analysis on, on the data we have highlights 77 service providers that, that appear to meet this criteria. And, and then there are additional things we can look at within this. We can look at uh, data quality. We can look at uh, water safety activities that are already being conducted which of these services are getting uh, public funding uh, or subsidy from government and, and also look at the legal arrangements. Uh, and so this might highlight some service providers that are eligible you know, right away to participate in these, uh, these types of uh, funding modalities and others that perhaps with a bit of technical assistance or with a clear opportunity where say stronger data systems can link to funding opportunities could, uh, could develop further. Uh, next slide, please. And from these 77, uh, we see the opportunity for uh, a results-based funding type of model to potentially engage uh, these service providers. They're working in approximately uh, in 28 countries and serving an, an estimated uh, 5 million people or so. And so these may be opportunities to both generate more data uh, and visibility on rural services while advancing the, the scale and sustainability of them. 
this might also provide more entry points in, in different countries for engaging some of these other conditions by perhaps working with a service provider, but that being a pathway to then engage other issues of public financing and policy alignment. Uh, next slide, please. So re resource permitting, uh, there could be opportunities to apply results-based funding models that we already know something about. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll talk here about the what the Uptime Consortium has been doing, which is developing a results-based contract that we're currently testing with five service providers in seven African countries. What we do is we use the same contract design with these uh, different service providers who are paid for results after service data are confirmed. And there's more detail on, on exactly what that approach is in the working paper that we published last week. Uh, this is just one example. The, the point uh, I want to make here is that identifying service providers that can deliver results and provide the data for it provides an opportunity to target funding uh, strategically to try and improve the, the scale and sustainability of these services. And then if these opportunities can advance to involve governments and address these wider conditions of policy alignment with public finance, then, then pathways to safe water services for 100 million people could emerge. Next slide, please. That's the big, big idea of where this could go. Uh, the next uh, immediate step is just looking at data quality. So thanks to everyone for participating in the survey. We have a much better idea of, of who's out there and what people are doing. Uh, and then the next step to look at, at specific opportunities for things like results-based funding is to assess this data quality. And so after the webinar, we'll be following up with uh, service providers to understand which service providers have sufficient data quality uh, to potentially participate in results-based funding models if, if resources become available. Next slide. Let's... And I'll leave it there. Uh, until then, we'd like to encourage you to access the full report uh, for more details and, uh, and, and further uh, implications on uh, what we found with the study. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Rob. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Duncan. Sean, did you want to come in here? I can see you've put your camera on. Uh, yeah, did you want to make a couple of, uh... A couple of remarks on that before we go to the Q&A. Um, I'll let you do it, please. Go ahead. Okay, great. So this is, um, I think you'll see that this is a really rich data set and it's really nice to have got some very interesting results from uh, all over the world. Uh, from from uh, from South America, from Central Asia, from all over Africa, from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, really really rich and and a lot of useful uh, information that I think that uh, all of us will find very useful. So please do download the reports. The link will be posted in the in the chat if you haven't already seen it. Um, and it's also uh, on the slide there, but it's also available on the REACH website and on the front page of the RWSN website. Uh, we've got uh, we've got about 10-15 uh, minutes and we've got some questions coming in um, in the Q&A, so please do keep on putting, putting them there. Uh, I'm going to start uh, on the more uh, process questions on the survey and then come back to the more thematic specific thematic ones so a question from bill twyman um governmental and non-governmental service providers are a very a very broad categories do did you break down these types of services into more specific groups such as local government provision versus national utility versus regional utility and if so analyzed uh these uh, availability by more, more specific groups. So, uh, Christina, uh, do you want to take that one? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, there was a lot of overlap in responses, so a lot of service providers identified themselves as, as multiple things. Um, so I think to, to systematically break them down into more specific categories would require some more back and forth and some more dialogue with uh, service providers to be able to do that accurately enough. So we kept the categories broad for that reason, and um, because it was hard to 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 identify a more systematic way of of breaking them down. Great, and I think uh, I'll I'll stick with you for a moment uh, on the next question from Dr. Yasin Mashana. 
considering the limitations during the widespread lockdowns in response to the COVID pandemic, what methods were used to capture the data? Sure, so this was an online survey um, which was promoted through RWSN and other networks especially, as well as service providers could recommend others that they felt um, would be relevant or appropriate to answer the survey. So it was, it was a survey of service providers uh, conducted online. And, um, uh, and from Jan Maloney, uh, great presentation, data analysis. Uh, could you please expand on local governments in low income settings and who uh, carry out water supply services in house? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there was a variety of different ways that um, that service providers describe their activities and those from local government, again, some were more closely involved in sort of a direct, um, direct more hands-on activities, like a, a utility might be included um, in some of those cases and others were, would be more removed. But again, it was hard to distinguish uh, specifically in each case what was going on, which is why we kept sort of the broader category of um, government linked service providers as as our unit of analysis for that. Great, thank you. Very clear. So now uh, I'm going to come to Rob now because uh, Sir Charles Tetchi uh, from Kenya has uh, put a couple of questions and remarks in the Q and A. I think specific to the Kenyan context uh, in terms of the devolution uh, of the of the process um, and I guess the different different roles. Um, would you like to say anything about that from maybe? Yeah, sure, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Um, I think on the devolution decentralization question, I mean, that's probably a wider topic for another day. What we did notice from Kenya, as Christina's pointed out, is we had a very strong set of responses from Kenya, um, which we have looked at and we sort of, you know, highlight in the report. So I would point Charles to that. The second question that he relates is about, um, how we can look at empowerment, which I think in terms of the report findings would be the technical assistance side. So how, as Duncan's explained, do we look to um, increase the potential for this type of funding mechanism where appropriate? Um, so it's useful to hear that point. Um, we're not really sure of what the answer to that is. I mean, we're just completing this, um, but it's certainly an area of research that I think um, we're interested to understand and it would be something we will follow up on as well. And if I may, Sean, just in terms of the data, I mean, this is all publicly funded by um, UKFCDO. So we will make the data set publicly available very shortly. We'll have to anonymize it to fulfill all of the ethics criteria, but people will, we can post it on RWSN and the REACH websites, but people can have access to the data and explore it for themselves as well very shortly. Great, thank you. So that was uh, that was Brian Banks' uh, question. I'm now going to come to Duncan uh, because there are two related questions from Adam Garley and uh, Russell Mickelson. Um, so Adams is in countries where you are piloting the results-based payments, who are you actually paying? Is it the local service provider directly or is it through an INGO who's paying a number of different smaller pr providers? And then linked to that uh, result, asks results-based or output-based aid has been around for more than 10, 15 years. What is the evidence that this time it will work? Water is very regulated, very much. Uh, what are the incentives for private operators? Great, thanks, John. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the, uh, the, the question around who we're paying. So I, I mean, Uptime is uh, and the catalyst facility we set up to test these results-based con contracts is a, is a test mechanism. Uh, so we're working with the five uptime partners, Uduma, Water Mission, Water for Good, Fundifix, and Wave, uh, which are a mix of organizations, uh, including private sector, social enterprises, some INGOs, but, but all of them have spun out effectively a, a, a local service uh, that is directly receiving the funding. So the photo you see here on the slide, uh, Fundifix, uh, that's one of the service providers that we're directly uh, contracting for this. And so they aggregate these service results uh, and then submit them to the Catalyst facility. And then after those results are confirmed, they get, they get paid for those services. 
Um, and then uh, why why is this going to work this time? These are these are not new ideas. Ab absolutely, the the idea of paying for results, the idea of saying uh, of output based data or however you want to badge it, ha has been around. I think for for us, the the challenge that we've really been trying to address is how can we make this approach scalable. How can we look at a finite number of key metrics? And so in the working paper we and the contract, we use three key uh, performance metrics that are that can accommodate different service models. They can accommodate different infrastructure, different countries, different types of organizations. And really, we're just looking at what is the service results in terms of reliability, use of infrastructure, and what users are paying, uh, and then pay for that after the fact. And so that's allowing us to take the same design, the same contract model, the same approach, and then apply it. We started in four countries. Now we've we've expanded that to seven. And we think that focusing on that simplicity and and you know focusing on a, a, a small amount of high quality verifiable data, uh, that's something that can help this model to grow beyond uh, what what to date has been a, a smaller number of, of pilots that are highly context specific, and, uh, and and quite a lot of work to set up in each area. Great, thank you. And um... Related to that, I think, is the question from Saeed Yasser Ahmad. Uh, how um, has the sustainability element been considered? Uh, I think it's linkages to community, linking, linking communities and utilities. Sure. So what we've been looking at here is where, where there are services, they're maintaining infrastructure, it works reliably. Um, so you have that, you know, that step change in the sustainability of the infrastructure. And, and then the challenge is that in many cases, what users are paying is not covering 100% of that service cost. And so what we're trying to bring in is this results-based uh, uh, funding mechanism issues, non-repayable funding to help address that gap between uh, service costs and service revenues so that the service can continue while motivating it, while providing an incentive in that contract model uh, for the service to improve over time. So to maintain that level of reliability, uh, but to progressively improve its financial performance to the point where either it no longer needs a subsidy or you, we've really clear, clarified the, uh, the need, what can be achieved, what does it cost uh, with enough empirical evidence that perhaps a government could come in with a, a public financing mechanism or a PPP or something like that to take that over. Great. And I'm go just going to, there's one more that's just come in before I go to uh, Saskia. Um, from Victor, uh, how do you determine how much you'd be given paid for performance-based outcomes? Right. So we've, uh, we've set a, a standard contract design with standard payments amounts, standard payment amounts that are informed by all the data that we've generated through the uptime consortium. So now it's over, uh, 60 years of data from all of the, the different service areas. And then we've used that to benchmark, uh, certain targets. And the details of that are specified in the working paper that uh, perhaps we, I can pop a link in the, in the chat box to that. Great. Right. Thank you. Right. Uh, Saskia, there's a, a question coming in French, which uh, translated uh, in the context of providing rural populations with drinking water. Is it possible to have partnerships with northern countries to facilitate research into natural methods for making surface water drinkable using plants? I guess this uh slightly off topic but kind of maybe relates to the water safety planning uh that you were talking about yeah thanks sean and thanks for the question um i think i think the the water safety activities that we were looking at in this survey and with the results based funding contract um design process so far have been a, a, a bit of a higher level so we're not looking at um particular treatment technologies necessarily, or, or, you know, perhaps it's even a source protection um, type of water safety activity where you might use plants to try improve the water quality. Um, so we haven't been looking at, at the, that level of detail, but one of the things that, um, one of the points that is discussed in the report is about um, the potential for some technical assistance um, to, to, to be part of enrolling more water service providers in the results-based funding. Um, so this I could see potentially as a as you know a method of treatment that might be something part of a technical assistance process to work with water service providers um, on how they might both monitor and also address water quality hazards. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. That. 
Yeah, and I think the next the next question is is probably sim similar to that uh, to your response, in, which was from John uh, Nedjo in terms of did you see any striking differences in the performance between community settlements served with boreholes and hand dug wells fitted with hand pumps and those served with pipe water services? Uh, so, uh, Christina, I guess you maybe didn't get in that it was it was the data was too high level. Uh, is that right? Or were you able to see something there? There was also a lot of overlap. So most or many service providers were working with a mixture of infrastructure and we didn't um, ask questions to disaggregate the answers related to um, one type of infrastructure if that's different than the other types of infrastructure. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Another question, while recognizing that your data set is predominantly from pipe water supplies, I'd be interested to understand, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I think that was the same, a very similar question, actually, in terms of the difference between water, water source types uh, in terms of water service provision models. Was there any difference in the outcomes of the types of service provision, such as downtime? Yeah, I think the, the answer remains the same, that unfortunately, because there was so much overlap um, in many of the service providers, we weren't able to distinguish um, yeah. to that level between yeah. the different infrastructure types. Okay, well, this is, well, this is great. The questions are really starting to flood in, typically just as we're running out of time. But uh, I think there's, there's, a, there's a question that came in the chat box uh, from... Um, Palita Dergal about um, asking about financial assistance in the Philippines. Maybe that's something that can be followed up with uh, one to one. Um, I'm just quickly looking at these other ones. Um, do you, uh, this is probably for Duncan, do you envision? Uh, water call. Oh, sorry, for Saskia. For, do you envision water quality thresholds to be part of the requirement for results-based funding payments, or is there a subsidy based on uptime only? That's from Mandy Goksu. Great. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, this is a, it's something we're working towards, trying to include um, water sa safety uh, outcomes as part of the results-based um, fr funding framework. Um, so it's, it, it wouldn't be based solely on up, uh, uptime, um, but it's, it's a complex thing to try and include the, the water safety outcomes. So, you know, even for example, if you consider microbial water safety versus the chemical water safety and the different activities that are needed to manage those different hazards. So we, we haven't got uh, set thresholds yet, but it's something we're working towards and drawing on a lot of work with the Uptime Consortium, um, Fundifix in Kenya particularly, and then also some of the work um, through the REACH program in Bangladesh uh, with the Safe Pani model, we're working towards, um, towards that. So happy to sort of discuss further um, at another time if, if you want to get in touch. Great. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, just time for a couple more. I think one, which I think is a, a good question from Oscar Velez to Duncan is how, how do you, I'm interpreting this, how, how do you control the results? How do you check the results? I, I imagine is the meaning of that question. How do you sure. verify them? Yeah, excellent question. So there, there's sort of three levels to that. The, the first is just, can a service provider submit quality at the level of detail that we require? The big difference when tracking uptime is you can't just have a spot check of whether or not it's working. You need a continuous record of when infrastructure breaks and, and for how long. And so that, that provides you a, a first level of detail. The, the second level is validation, where we can look uh, both for internal consistency within their records. We can look historically. So in many cases, we have many years of data for these service providers. So we can spot outliers from that. And then we can also look across service providers. So as our data set grows, we get a, a better way to valid or a better opportunity to validate uh, what's an outlier, what are sort of reasonable estimates for a given service. And then the third level that um, we're starting to bring in is the actual verification. So experimenting with different types of remote monitoring technology. Um, you know, there's, there's often timestamped flow meters on pipe systems. That's less common for hand pumps. 
but we're doing, uh, the, you know, Oxford done, has done some experimentation with that in Kenya, Udum has done some of that in Mali, and, uh, and now we're testing a couple of things in Central African Republic and, uh, and in Uganda. Um, I, I, I think the key thing that we've done so far is to specify what needs to be verified um, uh, in terms of uh, uptime. Uh, so it's basically time stamped use data uh, that can be collected retroactively is sufficient. That and revenue data is, is what we need. And then once you, you understand the verification requirement, then there are many technologies that can fit into that. Uh, and so that's you know, an area to, uh, to explore further. Great. And I'm going to sneak in one, one more question. Well, actually, it's, it's two combined because they're, they're very interesting. Uh, and that is uh, from Neural Osman and from Harold Ogwell. Uh, if we're dealing with very poor people at the bottom of the, of the pyramid and the only feasible solution for them is expensive to operate, um, uh, is, uh, how does that kind of work with, this, with what we're trying to do with the, with the uptime? Catalyst. Maybe I'll, I'll speak briefly and then Rob might have some more comments on affordability. What, what I can say from the data is that in you know, the, the majority of cases that, uh, where we have observations, uh, we see that the level of subsidy needed for these services is less than a dollar per person per year. To be clear, that's operational subsidy. You know, that's not necessarily all the capex uh, and you know long-term investment depreciation that type of thing. But just looking at, at cash in minus cash out to to run the service, uh, typically less than a dollar per person per year. And so, in that sense, I, I think there are opportunities to optimize these services so that you know they, they can deliver something reliable. I think in many cases, what we see are, are challenges to that are things like, you know, unclear uh, mandates where, you know, um, if you've got NGOs coming in to offer free services in parallel to someone who's trying to collect revenue, that undercuts the service um, and, and really affects the willingness to pay uh, rather than the, the ability to. Great. Well, thanks very much. And thank you for those great, great questions. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Rob now for some from closing, closing remarks, but just to say that this isn't the end. There is uh, an opportunity to, con to continue to discuss these, these questions and uh, develop uh, and explore the data more. So uh, Rob, over to you, please. Thanks, Sean. So I think the penultimate slide, if Christina, if we can flip over, um, we can see the availability of the report. I think Sean would encourage people, if you're not on the Sustainable Services D group, the D discussion group um, available through the RIWN network, that people could continue the conversation here. And I think um, Sean will provide a bit of direction on that in due course as we start to assimilate the, um, the report coming out just now. Um, and then the next slide, just some summary words. This is the sort of conclusion of the report really in terms of some of the questions I think we've looked at to today, um, the interest in how we engage more with national government um, in these processes going forward. We, we all recognize this as a, an opportunity, but you know, also a significant challenge. Um, the, the response from utilities I think was interesting for us in terms of this demarcation between rural and urban, what that actually means and the extent to which utilities may be part of this, um, this conversation going forward. So that's something we need to have a think a little bit more about. We don't really have clarity on that one at this point. And then just to mention this, the technical assistance side of things, we can see there's been a really positive response from um, the network um, to these questions. So there's certainly interest here, but there are questions in terms of how um, we, can, we, we can raise um, the standards and the approach, what is the demand and interest for that, um, and some steps we're thinking about that now through the REACH program and, and with RWSN, and we, we, we will be having meetings about this to discuss, and we can report back to everybody in due course. Um, and then the final thing is we, as we conclude is just to again thank everybody who's been part of the team putting this together and for all of you that are attending today and the many people who submitted data, this has helped us enormously. Um, I don't think we have all of the answers here, but we have um, a better set of questions to take us forward. So it's been enormously helpful. So we thank all of you um, for joining us and supporting and um, through RWSN and REACH, we will, be, we will be in touch in due course. So thank you to everybody and we wish you all a very good rest of your of your day wherever you're listening in from.